Can you imagine what it was like having to walk downstairs after you've just logged online to see your results and tell your family that you failed not one, but three out of the four exams you sat? Simon Alexander Ong. He's an international keynote speaker, award winning coach, and author of the best selling book, Energize. The book has won the 2023 Business Book Award and has received praise from some of the world's most influential writers. As I grew up, the focus was purely on academics. If you didn't perform, you can't have fun. Mm. When you enter a storm, you'll come out as a different person. What point in your life was that storm? I lost my mum to an unexpected accident. Back then, I just went further into my shell. It was a storm that very much made me who I am today because it kick-started the mental process for thinking what I wanted to do with my life. I had believed that success was determined by job titles because nobody in my immediate family had ever run a business. And so I waited until I got some success before I shared more with him. And I remember the moment I shared with him, I said, by the way, I've been working on this for the last couple of years. And I remember his first response was like, and how's it going? How much are they paying you? I'm like, what do you mean they? Are we moving into a world where people are valued below performance? The greatest gift that we can give another human is do you ever have sad days? Simon, <laughs> how are you, brother? Doing good, my friend. Yourself? Really good. I'm, I'm fascinated to get stuck into this because, mm. well, firstly, as the accolades of my guests have increased, mm. I realized that I need to start memorizing <laughs> what they've achieved and, and what they've mm -hmm. done because it no longer sticks in my head so mm. for now I'm going to be using my notes but you know there's a great term that you've used to describe yourself which mm. is a personal development entrepreneur mm -hmm. and I love this because you're also an incredible speaker mm. and you know you featured at international events conferences corporate events mm. organized by Google LSE Barclays the Institute of Directors, Virgin, Salesforce, 10 Downing Street. I mean, the list goes on. Mm. And in a number of these cases, you've been invited back to mm. do regular speaking events, mm. which just shows, you know, the scale of the impact and influence that you're able to have. On top of that, your book, Energize, which we will get into later, has received endorsement from some of the most well-respected mm. names, Simon Sinek, Marie Folio, incredible people themselves. Mm. But your journey wasn't always linear mm. so take me back to the roots of this story what is that family journey that led you to the uk so my parents are from malaysian origin and they came to the uk in pursuit of a better life my mum was a nurse my my dad is still an engineer and they were the only ones from their family that had left asia to come to the to, to the west and i was born in southeast england um, very much part of a minority i went to school and it's no understatement to say that i was only a handful of chinese not just in my year but across the entire school mm. and there were some good things and bad things about being part of a of a minority bad thing was you often felt left out uh, the good thing was I was growing up at a time where everybody was watching Bruce Lee films. And so they had automatically assumed me being Chinese, I knew how to fight. Right. I, I had the skills to defend myself. So that helped me not to get bullied as, as I grew up in primary and secondary school. And it wasn't until I started university when I moved to London and I stayed here ever since, but I had believed that success was determined by job titles because nobody in my immediate family had ever run a business mm -hmm. and that for me was a whole experience in itself to explore what it would be like to work for myself you mentioned that your parents came for a better life was that something that was quite unique even to them within their community and family or was there a trend where people from from that part of the world were moving for you know mm. a better life or opportunity I'm pretty certain it was part of a trend, yeah. but if I look at my family, and I'll take my dad's family as an example, he is one of four children, and he was the only one that came to the West when it came to attending university. 
the rest of his brothers and sisters stayed in Asia. They went to university and college in that part of the world. For him, it was a huge risk because he didn't know anybody here in the UK. And his parents, my grandparents, were not convinced it was a it was a good investment mm -hmm. because there was no guarantee this was going to work out. Yeah. And when he came over, he found accommodation. He was able to get around the fact that rent was high by exchanging his service of saying, I will look after your child and I will clean your house and do what you need to get done in exchange for free rent in your attic. And this was at a friend's place that he was able to do this exchange at as he was building up his income. And he was balancing multiple jobs at the time to get money coming in before he was able to go out and buy his own place. And I think, yes, it was a risk on one hand, but at the same time, knowing his history, it taught him so much. Looking at my own story of, mm. of the journey that has been made by previous generations, th there's a huge part of the history of my family background where mm. they were made to leave East yeah. Africa to come mm. to the UK. But for my dad, in his case, he also left earlier mm. in order to seek a better life. So there's an element of stepping into the unknown and taking that risk. Yeah. How that then translates to our generation. So I want to refer to this book called The Triple Package. Mm -hmm. Have you? I've not read it before, no. It's a fascinating book by two Yale professors. Mm -hmm. And The Triple Package looks at three distinct characteristics that have given people from an immigrant background mm -hmm. or cer but certain ethnical backgrounds almost this disproportionate advantage of why mm. they've done well mm. and it's based on a lot of us studies uh, regular listeners to this show will, will know what that is mm. uh, you know i've spoken about yeah. it before but one of the characteristics is impulse control mm. and the idea here is that being raised in a way and you know speaking from mm. uh, it gives the example of asian americans so yeah. with a chinese background where from a young age mm. they're taught to prioritize education mm. and sacrifice or compromise fun free time mm -hmm. and that's what's helped them their you know their ability or their acceptance to work so hard is why they mm. were able to get ahead yeah what's fascinating is the book also covers what it calls pathologies of these mm. characteristics mm. so again with impulse control it talks about how over time and especially with the next generation mm -hmm. these triple package parenting characteristics have had the reverse effect mm -hmm. so where the extreme level of impulse control that's enforced in the children leads them to internalize these feelings of mm. almost repelling that kind of behavior, mm. which creates an issue with self-esteem. Did you find any of this, any of these characteristics in your upbringing that may have led you in your early years to, you know, exhibit these kind of internalizing of the negative element of of these characteristics it's it's funny because as you were speaking it reminded me of how much i can relate to that in some way so as i grew up the focus was purely on academics it was do well at school get the best marks you can get to a good college get a good degree get to a well-paying job and if you didn't perform you can't have fun mm. because you don't deserve to have fun because you didn't do well at school and so i did not participate in a lot of the things that my friends did. I had to be home by a certain time. Uh, my my parents had to know what I was doing and where I was doing and who I was doing it with. And that came back to affect me when I was at university because when I left home, I also left the oversight of my parents and family. Right. And when you go to university now, none of them are watching. And that first two years I was at university all those things I could not do growing up as a, a, a as an Asian in in the western world I binged on them you know my first two years at university I would participate in going out late at night to parties and involved in drinking and all of the stuff basically I couldn't do mm. when I was a teenager and so by not having that exposure growing up I became so curious about what this world was like that I almost flipped to the opposite extreme when I was at university. 
which probably in hindsight <laughs> resulted in me failing my second year of university and having to resit that year, turning a three-year degree into a four-year degree. This draws me to something that you say in your book, and I've heard you mention a number mm. of times, which is that when you enter a storm, you'll come out as a different person yeah. to when you went in. Mm. Could you recall what point in your life was that storm? It's interesting because when you bring that quote up, which is a fantastic quote, by the way, there are a number of storms that come to mind rather than just one. The first storm that comes to my mind is when I was 17 and I lost my mum to an unexpected accident. You know, it wasn't like her death was expected. Uh, she had an accident, she went into a coma and she never, she never came out of it. That was the first storm uh, because this was at a, at a time where mental health was not talked about. Mm. There were no resources. There was nobody to point you in the direction of a therapist or someone to have a conversation with. Nowadays, it's everywhere and resources are at your fingertips. Back then, I just went further into my shell. Uh, you know, I was quite a shy child growing up, uh, as many British-born Chinese are. But I went even further into my shell when my mum passed away. So that was the first storm. And it would take me a couple of years before I was comfortable really opening up uh, about what happened. But it also taught me about the fragility of life um, and to focus on making this one life I have a good one. Mm -hmm. So that's the first storm that, that comes to mind. The second one was the university experience, failing that second year. Because up until that point, my life was very much linear. I got good grades. I went to a good school. I was top of the class. I went to a great university. And suddenly I failed a year. Mm. I, I mean, can you imagine what it was like having to walk downstairs after you've just logged online to see your results and tell your family that you failed not one, but three out of the four exams you sat? Wow. I, I still remember that scenario vividly because they had the champagne glasses ready. They had the champagne on ice. I was just lost for words. I didn't know what to say. I mean, my body language told them everything they needed to know that something was up and something unexpected occurred. But I felt so much shame. I felt so much shame that they've invested all of this money and time to get me to a good university. They were hopeful that I would use this as a springboard to get a good job. And now I failed a year and I have to resit this year. So that was another storm my face. And the third one that came to mind when you shared that quote was the global financial crisis. Mm. I started a job at Lehman Brothers in the middle of 2007, which for me was a huge achievement. If you remember that I failed a year a couple of years prior, right, yeah. I reset my year at university, I finally graduated, I was able to get a job, I was over the moon. I told my dad, my dad was like, Simon, work yourself up, maybe in a few years after you get a promotion, maybe reevaluate if you want to move to another company. But work hard now, build your reputation and see where it goes. 14 months later, my company ceased to exist. And here I was questioning whether I made the right choice. Is this industry what I thought it was going to be? And even though it was difficult and challenging at the time, as it is whenever your job is taken away from you and the future is now uncertain, when I look back, it was a storm that very much made me who I am today because mm. it kick-started the mental process for thinking what I wanted to do with my life. There's one thing that I know gets drilled into people, mm. and that's this idea that things don't happen to you, they happen for you. Mm. Was this something that you were able to embody as you went through these storms? I think so in hindsight. I think that the more storms I began to experience, the more I realize that the events that occur do not define your life, but it's how you respond to them. That's only something I began to learn as I faced more and more storms. So when I went through my mom's passing, when I felt that year at university, in the moment, I actually felt like it was the end of the world. You, you know, when I heard that my mom was passing, I had no idea how to handle life. I knew I would have to go back to school People would obviously ask, is everything okay? What happened? Why weren't you at school for the last few weeks? 
I would just lie because I was not right. in a position to share what happened. And the teachers were great because the teachers did not share what actually happened. They said, Simon, it's up to you to share. Uh, we would just say it was a personal event that you had to attend to and we won't share anything beyond that. So we leave it up to you if you want to share, which was fantastic. But I felt that it was the end, that there was no future. And it was the same when I failed my second year. I had so much shame that I'd let down a lot of people, my my family, my friends, uh, just the people who had believed in me. But by the time I got to the financial crisis, because I went through these storms, mm -hmm. I think I began to realize at that point that actually life can work for me if I start to choose my response and how I interpret what happens. And even if I look back more recently at the COVID pandemic, having gone through all of these storms before, the COVID pandemic didn't affect me as much as I thought it would because I had the experience of going through so many storms in the past. And I realized that because we are living in the feeling of our thinking moment to moment, when we change our thoughts about an experience, we change the reality that we then create. Wow. You have this innate desire and it's clear through the way you mm. speak and you speak about it in your book as well that you want to help people where did this desire or curiosity to help people reach their potential or unlock something that's holding them back where did that come from if i had to pinpoint where that desire came from i would probably say from my mom mm. because her occupation was a nurse so when you are a nurse you have this natural tendency to want to help people when you help people out of recovery, out of going for an accident or coming out of hospital, that gives you pride. That's the reward you get from being a doctor or a nurse. I didn't follow the route she wanted me to follow, i.e. I didn't become a doctor in my occupation. But I was drawn to this idea of helping people from university. But I didn't know that this experience would serve me later in life. Right. So when I was at the London School of Economics, I joined the LSE Investment Society. And the only reason I joined the Investment Society was because I thought it would help me in my job prospects. Mm. If I could put on my CV, I was part of the Investment Society and I learned how to invest money and how to grow that money. And I remember at the beginning of that year, so after we had the Freshers Fair and we recruited all of the new members for the society, we then had to have this meeting to share with the new members, what are our plans for the year? What are the events we're going to put on and how are we going to add value to the new members? And behind the curtain on stage, I was part of the committee and everyone was arguing who's going to go on stage first, who's going to talk about this. And I just interjected and I said, hey, why don't I go on stage and I'll share what we want to share with the audience? So they said, sure, because people generally hate public speaking. Right. So I went on stage and I just told the audience, here's what we got planned for the year. I'm Simon and this is what we hope to achieve by the end of the year. And that was it. I came down and after I conversed with the audience who were present, I met this guy called Peter. And Peter used to work for a company called Goldman Sachs. Mm. He quit that when he made his money to start a coaching school. Now, this coaching school was particular in the sense that it helped people in some of the country's top universities land jobs in the city. So when I talk about coaching, it was much more about how to interview well, how to present better and how to network. And he said to me, Simon, you present very well. And I think you have this ability to communicate in a way that engages with other people. I would love to explore bringing you on as a coach to help students get jobs in the city. I remember the first response I said to him, I joked, I said, I don't even have a job in the city. Mm -hmm. What value do you think I could add? And he said, it doesn't matter because the skills you've got, other people can benefit from learning those skills to get jobs in the city. Because if they could communicate as well as you do, if they can present as well as you do, and I'm sure you've got tips on how to network because you clearly have a lot of friends around you, then they could use that to land jobs in the city. And so while my friends were getting part-time jobs in shops and uh, hospitality, while they were student, I was working with students across the country to help them get jobs. And I did that for a couple of years uh, before I went into employment. And at the time, I thought nothing more of it. Right. But as I started to explore what success would mean for me and what I wanted to do long term, I kept coming back to that experience. And I was asking myself, why? What was it about that experience that made me keep revisiting it?
And I realized it was because of the impact. You know, yes, I got paid to help these students, but it was getting those text messages where they said, Simon, I just got my second offer. Simon, I've made it through to the next round. That was so rewarding for me that it didn't matter what I got paid. Just knowing I had that impact was incredible. Taking the experience that you had with the financial mm. crisis and what you've just told me, I like to call this a battle between meaning and money. Mm. And I want to refer back to that triple package yeah. book because one of the other factors that it talks about is while there are these big advantages of the three characteristics, mm. one being this feeling of insecurity often drives us forward because mm. we're always trying to strive to reach that next step. However, the traditional or conventional mindset of a lot of cultures, mm. you know, including I'm of Indian background and, you know, it refers mm. to the Chinese background is to follow those obvious measures of success. Mm. So that's the, the well-paying job or the respected career or the high salary, right? The issue with that is that there's sort of an artificial ceiling that's created mm. because when you go down those conventional routes, you can you can do well, but it, it hits the ceiling. Yeah. You don't you don't tend to go above it. Mm. You reached a crossroad. You could either have carried on down for the next conventional mm. opportunity that came along, but you decided to sort of go on that entrepreneur mm. entrepreneurial journey mm. as you realized your your desire to help others. Yeah. What was the expectation or the response from your your dad or the community <laughs> mm. when you decided to step away from that conventional means that a lot of people from certain backgrounds mm. end up getting stuck into because it's the expectation that's created by the society they live in? Great question. And, and the reason I laugh is because it, it, it was such an interesting experience sharing that with my family and the evolution of how my dad responds to the work I do now. So before I dive into that, I think it just wanted to tap onto what you were saying about most people understanding the difference between money and meaning. Because when I look at society, and this relates a bit to energy, when I look at society around us, what I see is that so many of us are exhausted, mm. not because we are doing too much, but firstly, we are doing too little of the things that bring us joy. And second, we're running someone else's race. And so what we're actually experiencing is not physical exhaustion, but spiritual exhaustion. We're exhausted spiritually because we're not doing something that makes us feel alive. Yeah. And so this financial crisis, it kickstarted the mental journey of asking myself these important questions. So even though after Lehman, I would still be in the industry for nearly 10 years, I started the journey outside of work to explore this new world and what would be possible. And it wasn't until 2016 when I handed in my resignation and fully quit the world of work to go to work for myself. And I remember as I did so, my first thought was, how am I going to tell my dad? How am I going to tell my family about the work that I do? And at the time, my dad was working abroad. So that was in my favor. Because when my dad called me up and he said to me, Simon, how is work going? I would buy time. I, I would just say to him, same old, it's going good. I'm still working hard for that promotion. But you know, the economy is a little tough at the moment. So fingers crossed, I get that promotion next year. All the while, while I was out of a job, trying to build this business. And it wasn't until I started to achieve some success that I began to share with him more about what I was doing. Mm. Because there was this balance. Um, on the one hand, my dad wanted me to do well. He wanted me to be in a well-paying job, in a respectable profession. On the other, he did want me to do stuff I was passionate about, but he was concerned it wouldn't be successful. And so he didn't like the idea of quitting something that was stable, that had a monthly paycheck, that had your benefits covered, you had insurance, you had a bonus, to something where you have no idea month to month if you are going to get paid. And so I waited until I got some success before I shared more with him. And I remember the moment I shared with him, I said, by the way, I've been working on this for the last couple of years, and this is what I'm now focusing on now that I've left the world of work. And I remember his first response was like, and how's it going? How much are they paying you? I'm like, mm. what do you mean they? I have to earn all of this myself. <laughs> right, yeah. So his main concern was about money still. 
you know, the same way you wanted me to work in these jobs, it was like, how much are you going to pay for the speaking? How much are you going to pay for the coaching? And then I told him, well, enough that it's allowing me to keep having a go at making this sustainable. But hey, in the meantime, I've just done this interview on BBC News and, and Sky News. And at that point, for some reason, he associated that media exposure with success. And he goes, oh, send me the link. And when he started sharing my recordings and the videos I had on social media with his network, mm. I knew at that point he was slowly changing his perception about the path that I was on. And I still remember in April 2022 when the book Energize was published, I had him and my family on the front row of that book launch. There were 350 people there. And to see him like a kid in a candy shop when he was walking around afterwards during drinks saying, Simon, is that the person on this TV show? Is that the celebrity chef from this show? I said, yeah. Do you want to take a photo? <laughs> and my dad was like, yeah, can you take a photo of us? And so seeing him enjoying yeah. what I was now achieving for me was such a beautiful moment. It's amazing. And something that you touched on there was that you waited mm. until you reached some level of success. During that period, was there ever a moment that you felt like turning back on the entrepreneurial journey? Lots, lots of moments. Yeah. Because I think when you look on the outside, at entrepreneur success stories, it can be easy to think that it was a straight line. Yeah, They quit the job, they launched this business, and boom, they have achieved what they achieved today. But I think behind the scenes, it's never like that. So I remember when I quit my job, I had three paying clients. And within six months, that went down to one. Because those other two clients, for whatever reasons, decided not to continue. One moved abroad, one couldn't afford it anymore. And I had one paying client. And there were times where I even shared with my now wife, I said to her, do you think I'm going to have to go back to employment? I had only saved up enough for around 18 to 20 months, assuming I had zero income for that time period. And now with just one client, I was thinking, how much longer is this sustainable? Mm. And so there were many times I couldn't sleep thinking, should I go and search for a job again? Should I go back into the world of finance? But every time when I was about to send that CV or about to send an email to a recruitment consultant, I stopped myself and just reminded myself of why I was doing this. Yeah. You know, what is the vision here? Why did I quit in the first place? What am I trying to build? And every time I re reflected on those questions, I got back to work, I went out, I worked harder than I ever did before, and I got patient, consistent, and persistent. I love that. And there's one thing that you mentioned in your book and you, mm. you also touched on here which is you know the reason that we have this burnout mm. is not because we're doing too much because yeah. we're not doing enough of the stuff that we mm. get joy in and you know even when i read that in your book it took me back to this exact journey that i'm yeah. on where for me there's this this big value and raising awareness of certain issues and the, you know the influence of cultures and roots mm. that i want to get out in that i got caught up in perfectionism is one thing but just the idea of like oh i need to really make sure certain messages get out to the mm. point where i did feel like it was burning me out and i remember this one day i was making one video clip and it gave me so much joy when i when i listened <laughs> back to it that while i was making that that clip that that shortened clip even though it took me a while to make mm. i enjoyed releasing that so much and i had i didn't have any attachment to mm what other people will think of it. I just had so much joy in making mm. that. And I think that really shifted my mindset to this idea of, you know, e even when you are on this journey of getting your purpose mm. out to the world, creating your legacy, you have to enjoy yeah. doing so. You have to find that, that genuine enjoyment or happiness mm. in doing that. Otherwise, regardless of how much value you think it's giving you in the world, you will, you will burn out. I mean, to put it simply, if the process or the journey isn't fun, it is going to feel like a chore. Mm. And when it feels like a chore, it's only a matter of time before you give up, Yeah, before you give up and go home. And that's what so many people do is they start something with the best intentions. And when they face their first hurdle or their first big challenge, they give up and go home. And there's something that I want to pick out from your book instead of focusing on finding 
our purpose mm. and feeling overwhelmed by the pressure. We can take small steps towards discovering what we're meant to do yeah. by exploring our curiosities. Mm. What does that mean in real terms? If I look at my journey from being an employee to entrepreneur, I could have just stopped myself from making any progress if I said, well, I have no idea what business I want to get involved with. I have no idea what I want to do long term. So I'm just going to go to another finance job. I'm just going to focus on being good in the finance profession. But then it would take me a long time to even begin this path of entrepreneurship. And that's something I notice in a lot of people. They often say to me, I have no idea what I want to do, what I want to do in my life. I don't know what my purpose is. But when I do, I'll stop. Mm. When I do, I'll start on this journey. But right now, I have no idea what that is. And it can be easy to use that as an excuse because thinking about our purpose can be quite heavy. It, it can be quite overwhelming. Yeah. And so I say to people, if you don't know what your purpose is, and we don't always know, it's not like we wake up one morning and go, Eureka, I know what my purpose is. I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. I say, start with exploring your curiosities. So when I first started this journey, I was most curious about how people became successful in business. Mm. So what did I do? I went out and bought lots of books about business. I went to business seminars and business workshops. From there, I got an insight into all the potential businesses that I could get involved in. I was curious about certain businesses. So I started a couple of businesses. They did not work out, but they taught me a lot of lessons. Again, curiosity drove that. I saw an advert on my Facebook feed for a coaching event. Curiosity got me to that event. And by the end of it, I said to myself, I want to sign up. I want to learn the skill of coaching and I want to go out and apply it. Again, that was all driven by curiosity. I had no attachment to the outcome. I had no idea if it was going to work out or not. At that point, I still did not know if coaching was my purpose. I was just go to this event, see what's going to happen. The worst is I lose a weekend. Yeah. And so I was just following my curiosity. And then when I qualified, it would still be another couple of years before I would quit fully the world of employment. And so in those couple of years, I became curious about transitions. How did people go from employment to entrepreneurship? And so I just started researching everybody who had gone through the same journey, who had quit their job and started their own business or their own company. And what did they have to work on in order to make that as seamless as possible a transition? Now, of course, in reality, there's no such thing as a seamless transition. But what were the things that they had learned, what they got wrong, what uh, was the wisdom that they were imparting that I could absorb myself? Yeah. And so all of this was driven by curiosity. We all have curiosities, but the reality is a lot of us fail to listen to it. We suppress that voice and we get so busy running around in circles without moving anywhere. And we end up complaining about the fact we have no time, yet we waste the time we have. Suppressing that voice. Mm. This is, I think, such a critical point to, to get across because you mention it as the inner critic, mm. right? Phil Stutz, who's a, a psychiatrist to a yeah. lot of the celebrities, uh, there was a documentary on him that Jonah Hill did. Mm. When you described inner critic in your book, it reminded me of what Phil Stutz calls part X. Mm. And he refers to that as our inner voice mm. that will stop at nothing to prevent you from reaching that version that you think you can be of mm. yourself. And that can go from anything from whether it's based on your career or mm. you're trying to do a diet or even just to take up that next opportunity, that inner voice will do whatever it can to tell you that you are not able to do that. So mm. you'll procrastinate or you'll binge eat, gamble, whatever mm. it may be. What do you see as your part X or mm. inner critic? And how have you been able to, or have you been able to silence that over time? Mm. I think the reality is we have two voices. We have the inner critic and we have the inner guide. Now, at any given moment, the question is, who are we giving more attention to? Is it the critic or is it the guide? And over time, I've learned to spend less time worrying about the critic mm. and more time focusing on listening to the guide. And we all have those two voices in our head. Sometimes people will say, I talk to myself in the shower. And that's just you having a conversation between your guide and your critic. Your wow. guide will say, yeah. 
yes, we can do this. We should give this a go. And the critic will say, hang on a minute, we have no experience in this. What if this doesn't work out? And so often when people speak to themselves in the shower, it's just them having a conversation between the two selves. We all have that critic inside of us, whatever age we are at, whatever level we are at in terms of our journey. And I think for me, it's all about creating a healthy relationship with it. Mm. It's like there are behaviors we have that you cannot eliminate simply because we are human. We are naturally going to have these behaviors. So the question I think is less about how to eliminate those behaviors and more how to have a better relationship with those behaviors. So if I'm addressing my critic who might say, Oh, Simon, you can't do that. Everybody's doing it. How are you going to succeed? It's already been done. Then what I might do is instead of saying, okay, you're right, I will focus on the tiniest thing I can do, do that, and then say, actually, that wasn't so bad, and slowly win over the critic by showing that maybe it is possible. And I think that's the big challenge we have is that often when people set goals, we set this bold vision of a goal, which is great, but then we spend too much time focused on the outcome that it becomes overwhelming. Mm. So if I were to use a, a live example, if you were planning to run a marathon and you've never run a marathon before and fitness just isn't part of your lifestyle, if you focus on completing that marathon, it's gonna feel overwhelming because it's huge. It's a mammoth task if you've never run a marathon before. But if you break it down and chunk it down to tiny, tiny steps, such as step one is simply join a running club. Yeah. Step two is start reading running magazines so I can learn how to get myself in the best condition to run a marathon. Step three, start changing my diet. Now, if it's not a wholesale change, what are some of the things I can introduce to complement what my lifestyle currently is? Now, as you start ticking those boxes, what happens is the critic slowly gets won over. The critic starts thinking, hmm, maybe this could be possible. And, and so what you're doing is you're building a healthier relationship with a critic by showing that credit what's possible just by building momentum. And what we need to build momentum is courage. The courage to start, because once you start, you build confidence. As you build confidence, both your critic and your guide start to ask themselves, what else could be possible? And that's what I mean by having a healthier relationship with it. I really like the point you made about being mm. in the shower. And a lot of the times you will talk to yourself. Yeah. But I think it's it's done it on such an autopilot mode because mm. you're so used to as you wake up every day and brush your teeth and have a shower. Mm. But even I'm going to do that now to actually think, what am I talking to myself yeah. about? Because if you ask me now, you know, the last time that you were brushing your teeth, mm. what did you talk to yourself about? I wouldn't be able to tell you. Yeah. If you even asked me, was it was it a critical conversation or was it a forward thinking conversation? Mm. I probably wouldn't be able to tell you. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, the idea of just being more conscious about are you listening to the inner critic mm. or are you listening to the inner guide to begin with? Yeah. And and then being able to work out, okay, do I need to silence that critic more? Mm. That's a, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> and it, it's what I love about your book because it gives the overarching broad themes of the mindset mm. shifts that are needed to align those yeah. four energy pillars that mm. you talk about. But it also gives us very practical day-to-day -day tips that allow these changes mm. to happen. And, and some of them you've mentioned. And, and you know, one of the other things that I know that you mentioned a lot is something that you found quite powerful mm. is writing down your goals. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I think it's going back to that company example. It's one reason why it's called a vision statement mm. because we are by nature human beings that do better or re rely on visualizing mm. things right how important do you think that visualizing element of whatever that goal may be is in order to get to it it's critical yeah it's critical because you have to see it in your mind first before you can create it in reality yeah a lot of people live off this this perception of i'll believe it when i see it yeah you know they're skeptics you share with them tools and tricks that they can use in their own lives and they question it and they say, I'll believe it when I see it. But for the people who become successful in their field, they operate it from a different lens. They operate it from the lens of, I'll see it when I believe it. Right. And they understand that once they believe, 
And the way that you build belief is by constantly visualizing what you want to see manifest. Mm. Once you build that well of belief, what happens is you begin to see the path forward. But you can't see the path if you just don't believe in it. It's why I, I always say to entrepreneurs who are just starting out, there are always two sales that occur. The second is selling you to others and the first is selling you to you. Yeah. If you can't sell you to you, how the hell are you going to sell you to others? Because that energy will be felt by the people that you speak to. If you believe in what you have to offer, whether it is a product or a service, then guess what? It is going to be very easy for whoever you speak to to also believe in what you have to offer. Th that's the, the final point that I want to touch on, which relates to people and to companies, is something that you call the human energy crisis. Yeah. What is this in real terms? The human energy crisis, if we look at what organizations are going for at the moment, is the fact that more and more people in surveys conducted by companies are reporting feelings of burnout, feelings of depression, feelings of exhaustion. And that hits a business hard. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not see it immediately, but it hits a business in terms of how those employees show up, what they give to the company, and the energy that they bring to the work that they do. However, if you are to address that and your employees show up committed, excited, and energized to do more than their basic job description, guess what? Your business thrives. And that's what we're facing now. We're facing a period of history where post-pandemic, many organizations across the planet are going through a human energy crisis. And until we understand how to manage not just our own energy, but the energy of our organization better, we're going to face a lot of difficult challenges in the coming years. Because you might not see it now, but it is going to manifest in the years ahead. And it reminds me of something that I heard recently, which is since the, I think it's post-World War II, right? Mm. Where, where we went through this baby boom. And it's fascinating because for the first point in probably, at least in, in our recent history of a few centuries, there became a time when there was a baby boom faced with such economic growth that came after the mm. war that we moved into this space where before industries were very driven by this this we culture mm. and it became two things a me culture mm. as well as a culture of excess consumption and mm. that's when you saw things like disposable cameras and you know disposable mm. products because we had so much in consumption that we we, mm. we were buying up that oh we needed more stuff yeah. to get rid of and i think that's knocked over into to businesses mm. where you know, you get this this me culture that's developed mm. where everyone kind of operates for themselves. And then later, I think when it became common to, I think Ronald Reagan, yeah. when he fired a bunch of air traffic, <laughs> uh, have you heard about this? Mm. Where, yeah, he fired a bunch of the air traffic stewards where then it set this precedence that you can't, mm. you know, people are become disposable. Yeah. Are we moving into a world where this is the norm, where people are, valued below performance or do you see somewhere where we can shift back to people being regarded above the outright performance of you know companies mm. or or enterprises or e even countries as a whole i'm an optimist yeah so i'm hopeful that people will become more valued as humans and less as numbers I mean, if I just look at the developments in the corporate industry over the past decade, you now have diversity and inclusion officers, you have chief people officers, you have a lot more programs that are focused on employee well-being. So I'm hopeful. But I know this is only the beginning. Yeah. Because for many companies, this is still alien. Why should we invest in something that is not going to give us a return on investment? Well, of course, it's very difficult to measure some of this you won't know until you've put this into action and seen the results over a number of years. But the fact is, if you look at the companies that do invest in their well-being, that do treat people like people, then you just have to look at the feedback. You have to look at the way they show up at work. You got to look at how they tell people about the job that they do. Mm. They do in such a way that they invite other people to want to find out more about that company. 
it's why certain companies are spoken about more than others yeah. when it comes to leadership conferences or podcast recordings because of how they run their business, of how they treat their staff. It's true. And, you know, there's uh, this idea of disengagement at work. Mm. And, you know, studies have also shown there where when a an employee mm. is given negative feedback, 20 to 25% of them disengage from work. Yeah. When they're given positive feedback, only 1% disengage from work. Mm. When they're given no feedback, over 40% disengage from work. Mm. And I think it's you know fascinating to see there that it's better to give someone mm. negative feedback than to not give them feedback at all mm. because then at least they're seen yeah. as a human and at least they're engaged with. And you know, I think you know, to your point, the issue is that when people are seen not as people, yeah. They're not regarded in the same way as mm. another human that needs interaction with. The same way, you know, within your family, unless there's issues, you, you, you go home and you interact with everyone. Yeah. And I think that's a key point that a lot of businesses don't treat their employees like people and family. And that's why disengagement levels are mm. so high, where I think at one point there was a study done in the US where 80% of the the population were dissatisfied with their job mm. i mean we can even take it beyond business yeah in the sense that the greatest gift that we can give another human is the feeling that they've been heard and appreciated mm. I, I still remember reading in one book by the author tony schwartz where he shared this humorous but also fascinating insight from a psychological study he said that these psychologists went to a hospital and they asked the nurses what did you like about your job and what did you hate about your job? Now, of course, what they liked is the fact they had an impact, they were working with patients, that they were helping people back out into the world, which is what people in the medical profession really enjoy. Yeah. But on the downside, what they hated is the fact they did not feel appreciated by the surgeons because the surgeons got the glory. Mm. When an operation went well, everybody talked about the surgeons, but nobody really talked about the nurses who helped the patients to recovery. So the psychologist went to the surgeons and they asked them the same question. What do you like about your job and what do you hate about your job? And for the hate, they said the same thing. We don't feel appreciated by our managers. So they went to the managers and they asked them the same question. And they responded with the fact they also didn't feel appreci appreciated by the government. And wow. so what was fascinating is that all each of these different levels of people had to do was simply show appreciation. If we show people that they are appreciated, guess what? they show up so much differently. Yeah, it, it's an amazing point that you've made. And mm. we've touched on so many elements of your book. And I'm going to put it in the description for people who mm. haven't read it. Because again, I think, you know, we're only touching the surface with yeah. the level of value you can get from it. Another benefit of the book for you mm. is how it's brought you in front of some inspiring and mm. amazing individuals that you've, you know, also mentioned at your book launch. During these interactions with, you know, people that you may have once aspired to and looked up to yourself mm. is there anyone you've come across that's really over delivered on what you've expected them to be mm. like when you then met them face to face sure the first person that pops up into my head is marshall goldsmith uh, somebody who's written numerous new york times best-selling books and is known to be the world's number one executive coach we had this opportunity to speak at an event in dubai in september 2022 so I flew over to Dubai, it was a three-day event, and we were both in the lineup to speak to an audience in the Middle East. And I remember going to the green room where the speakers hang out, and I caught up with Marshall in person. First of all, I thanked him for his endorsement for the book, mm. and I said, Marshall, here's a copy of my book. First of all, thank you so much for signing it, and I want to give you a signed copy as a thank you. And if you have a few minutes now, I would love to just shoot a very quick interview just to gauge some of your thoughts to my audience. And he said, sure, let's do it. You got your camera guy? Let's sit down, let's grab a seat and have a conversation. And we ended up having a 20 minute conversation about everything from happiness to fulfillment, to leadership, to personal development, to writing books, to speaking around the world. But he was also very present mm -hmm. in that conversation. And he listened to everything I shared, he offered his insight and his wisdom to everything I threw his way. And just for him to give up that short time, because I know how busy he is, yeah. was amazing. And, and I think he is someone that certainly 
went beyond the expectations I had uh, before I met him in person. Has there ever been situations where you've come across someone who, you know, you've provided so much value to mm. them, they've implemented it, and it's it's taken them towards where they want to be, only for you to maybe see that the direction mm. they've gone in because they wanted to has not been the same sort of positive development for their character. Maybe it's brought out more of their ego. Have mm. you ever sensed that, you know, in the support you've given someone and the direction that you've taken in them, mm. that you've seen a different side to them where you feel like you would want them to realign? Yeah, honestly, I've not seen that yet with the per with the people I've dealt with as clients, but I have seen it a lot in society as a whole. Yeah. So, and I'll explain a little more what I mean by this is I'm often asked about what is the greatest challenge in personal development. And I used to say it's applying what you learn to become successful. That is, of course, a valid challenge. We read a lot, we learn a lot, but how much do we actually put into action to become successful? I don't see that as the main challenge now. Because when you have all of these resources at your disposal, you've got podcasts you can listen to, books to read, YouTube videos to watch, there's no excuse to not having the knowledge to become successful. For me, the real challenge is once you are successful, is remaining who you were yeah. before you became successful. Because once people reach a level of success, ego can take over. And we become a very different person to the person that was early in the journey trying to reach those heights that we are now enjoying. That for me is the real challenge success can very quickly change people for the worse mm. what do you do mm. in order to keep yourself in check mm. from going through this kind of thing i think humility plays a big part in it uh it's to keep my humility in check it's just to get my wife get my close friends just to be as honest as they can with me you know, they, for me, give me the best feedback because I give them permission not to sugarcoat things. You know, if you see me deviating from the person you know me to be, just tell me. Yeah. And it's always a good reminder that you should not forget the people who have been part of your journey before you were who you are. Um, and that's what helps me to stay grounded. And I'm also inspired by people who reflect that. Yeah. You know, when people say to me, Simon, who inspire you when you think about people that still live with that humility? The examples of the boxer Ricky Hatton, Keanu Reeves, the actor, they come to mind because they have been successful in their own profession, but yet they are so down to earth mm. and they're so relatable that you could just have a drink with them and have a very interesting conversation. And that's why those people are inspiring to me because they have not lost that connection with who they are. Mm, I love that. Mm. Oh, so what's next for you? I am attached to no outcome and open to everything. So there's certain things I'm working on at the moment. So I would love to take some of my work onto television and film uh, to speak more internationally. But yet at the same time, I'm just enjoying every minute. And... For me, the magic of life is the fact that at any given moment, life can change for the better. Yeah. You just don't know when. So all I'm doing at the moment is stacking the odds in my favor as best I can and then trusting in the universe. It's clear to see and what I love about this conversation and also even when I first met you is mm. that you really do embody what you speak, mm. and, you know, both in terms of the words you say, but the energy that I've, I'm sure a lot of people agree mm. when they meet you in person, the energy that they feel that they get off you. Yeah. And, you know, the energy that you talk mm. about it is contagious. Yeah. And there's no act too big or too small mm. that can have that positive impact to getting them towards where they are. So kindness is a superpower. Kindness is a superpower. And, and, and one question I always get my followers, my clients or my audiences to reflect on on a daily basis is how can I add value to someone's life today, no matter how small? Yeah. Doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It can be something very small, such as an introduction, sending something helpful to them, giving them time to be heard, 
how can you add value to someone's life today? Because our worth as a human is determined by how much more we have given to the world than we have taken from it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, so much for everything that you've shared. We have a closing tradition on this <laughs> podcast where over time I've gathered a list of questions that previous mm. guests leave. Mm. From that, I choose two to ask mm. to a guest coming on. So question number one, what is one thing that people tend to misunderstand about you? That I am as organized and structured as it may look on the outside. I think often when people look on the outside in, they automatically assume I must be very organized and very structured. To some extent I am, but in many cases I'm just winging it, as many people are. We tend to look at people that inspire us, who are ahead of us, and automatically assume they must have everything together. Right. They must know exactly where they're going, and they must be so intentional by every single decision they're taking. But everyone, no matter where they are in their journey, they're all winging it. I'm winging it to some extent, and it makes sense if you're winging it too. So don't worry if you are winging it as you begin your journey. Do you ever have sad days? Absolutely. Uh, we are humans, which means that we experience the spectrum of emotion. And there are days where I feel euphoric and there are days where I feel sad and everything else in between. The beauty of having studied and lived through personal development, from reading books to being around the right people to doing what I do, is that when I do have those days, they don't last as long as they used to. Mm because I now have the tools and the insight and understanding on how to manage those days in a way that is healthy for me. I love that. <laughs> and the final question, and I'm going to tie this into something that you've also said previously, which is to progress, there is always a trade-off. Mm. So as you started saying no to the activities that probably weren't as conducive mm. for your progress, did you ever lose anything that you didn't expect to? I guess thinking on that question, the only thing that comes to mind that I may have lost is unforeseen opportunities. Because I also understand that whenever I say no to something, even if I know at the time it is not aligned to what I'm doing now, uh, I also understand I cannot predict mm. where things lead. Some things I've said yes to which only in hindsight should have been a no, right. have led to things that were beautiful. But again, you can't predict these things ahead of time. So I would say that's probably the only thing that comes to mind that I would have traded off is potential other avenues that could have opened up other opportunities I would never be aware of. That's powerful. <laughs> Even within that, there's, there's such a strong message of you don't live in regret for a lot of the decisions. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to find peace yeah. in the fact that you cannot say yes to everything. Yeah. That when you say no to some things, and again, you are only saying no based on the information you have at any given moment, you are giving yourself more time and space to focus on the things that are hell yes for you. Yeah, yeah. And that gives you time to make progress in them because if you say yes to a lot of things, you are diluting your energy. Yeah. And if you dilute your energy, you cannot make the progress you want to make because you're dividing yourself up in a lot more ways than necessary. And so the progress you make in each is going to be tiny. Thank you so much, Simon. And um, you know, I really hope it's inspired some people who mm. haven't heard of you or your book yeah. to pick that up because there's endless lessons and mm. I try to extract as much as I could from the man himself <laughs> after having read it. And you know, you've done such a great job at sharing from the vulnerable personal mm. stories to you know everything that you've learned over the years. So I just have to say it's a huge, huge privilege to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Simon.